When looking back on the Final Fantasy franchise, it's easy to see that care and thought has gone into each of the worlds that have been created for players to explore. Whether it's the Earth from Final Fantasy IV, the World of Ruin from Final Fantasy VI, Spira from Final Fantasy X, or even Grand Poles from Final Fantasy XIII, players around the world have often found themselves drawn in and immersed by the world building Square has provided. But not all worlds are created equal. Standing out from the crowd in the greater Final Fantasy canon is of course the world in which Final Fantasy Tactics was set, Ivalice. Few worlds in the Final Fantasy franchise have had the same effect on players as Ivalice, and such was its initial impact that it was even expanded, appearing as a setting for Final Fantasy XII and the multitude of games that made up the Ivalice Alliance. Of all of its appearances, however, none were quite as important or iconic as the original, and it's why, amongst other elements, there continues to be so much intrigue about Final Fantasy Tactics. And it's that intrigue that we'd like to satisfy today. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more high quality Final Fantasy content and from unique status effects that remain exclusive to Tactics even to this day, through to an awesome mode that was straight up removed from the North American release during the localization process, let's run through some facts about Final Fantasy Tactics in our typical granular style that we're pretty confident you still did not know. Even though Final Fantasy Tactics was released in 1997, the concept for the game was conceived four years prior. When working on Final Fantasy VI, Hironobu Sakaguchi had seen the rise in popularity of tactical role-playing games and thought a similar experience could work if aligned with the Final Fantasy brand. But due to his busy schedule involving the mainline Final Fantasy games and Chrono Trigger, he was unable to realise the idea at the time and opted to put it on the proverbial shelf. Around the same time, a young developer called Yasumi Matsuno was finishing up his first major project, Ogre Battle, The March of the Black Queen. Unbeknownst to him, between this and its sequel, Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together, Matsuno would gain a fan in the form of Sakaguchi, who admired his work and what he was doing to be innovative within the tactical role-playing genre. Matsuno would end up joining Sakaguchi at Square, helming the shelved tactical Final Fantasy game. But there were question marks as to how this ended up coming about, and in the only known interview conducted with Sakaguchi and Matsuno by Famitsu, the topic of how Matsuno came to join Square was raised. In response, Sakaguchi claimed it was mere coincidence. After finishing up on Tactics Ogre, Matsuno was just trying to figure out his next career move, and he saw a posting for a position at Square, an opportunity he did not want to pass up. Sakaguchi then conducted the interview process, hired Matsuno, and would then assign him to helm the project born from Sakaguchi's idea for a tactical Final Fantasy game which would become the now iconic Final Fantasy Tactics. Since then, this has been assumed as the official story of how Matsuno became involved with Final Fantasy Tactics, but what if it wasn't the whole truth? Fast forward some 24 years, and the topic came up by chance during an interview that content creator Soldier First Class was conducting with Sakaguchi to promote Fantasian. During the interview, Sakaguchi mentioned his love for Tactics Ogre, and how his love for the game was probably the reason why he invited Matsuno to join Square, a stark contrast to his previous version of the story. As he went on to explain via the translator, Quest happened to be struggling, and Matsuno didn't have anywhere to go and really show his strength, which is why I invited him to Square, because I thought that's where his talent could really shine. Based on all of this, it's hard to know which version of the story is true, as so much time has passed, and it's not something either party has discussed openly very much. But, seeing as Matsuno brought over several of his staff members from Quest to Square in order to work on tactics, it seems that the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle, and Matsuno did not just happen to apply to Square at the right time. Sticking with the odd theme of defectors, Final Fantasy Tactics featured some unique status effects, and one of them, which has remained exclusive to the game, was Traitor. All kidding aside, status effects have been an integral part of the Final Fantasy experience since the series' inception, and many mainline entries have featured a wide variety of game-specific examples. These would have appeared on top of the quite familiar status effects such as Sleep and Poison, which have been recurring ever since they first appeared in the original game, but subsequent games featured unique status effects like Pig, Imp, and Sedate that up until the release of Tactics had only ever appeared in their initial game. It would only be in more recent times, thanks to the MMOs and mobile games, that these status effects would resurface, as the developers have trawled through the archives to introduce some nostalgic elements. 
Tactics, however, has the honour of featuring three specific status effects that appear nowhere else in the franchise, although who knows how long it will stay that way. First off, as alluded to previously, the Traitor status, also known as Invitation, allow players to temporarily and sometimes permanently recruit enemy units to their own party. This would usually be done in battle or by using the orator jobs in Tice or Tame abilities. As this could quite literally turn the tides of battle, it would make sense that players would become concerned about mutiny within their own ranks. But fear not, as the developers made it so that enemy units could not inflict the traitor status on units within the player's party. Next up is the vampire status, which could be inflicted through the use of the similarly named vampire or bloodsuck abilities. And while the vampire ability can be found throughout the rest of the franchise, the status effect has only ever appeared in tactics. It would cause the afflicted unit's evade percentage to drop to zero, before forcing them to attack any unit in movable range with the Vampire ability, prioritising enemy units first. If all of the player's party was turned, it would result in a game over, and the only way to cure the status was with Holy Water or using the spell, the Spellner. The last status effect is by far the most interesting and unique, and that is the Atheist status. Any unit afflicted with status would see their faith stat drop to zero, and due to their newfound inability to believe in gods or magic, this rendered all magic ineffective against them, while also leaving them unable to use it themselves. Granted by utilising abilities such as Mystic's Disbelief, the Templar's Atheist, or through the Goku Pole Weapon, the Atheist status was temporary, but a similar effect could be achieved more permanently, if the player so desired, through the Orator's Enlighten ability. While it was not possible to permanently lower a unit's faith to zero through this method, it would make inducing the Atheist status much easier. While status effects definitely make for more interesting and strategic battles, sometimes their implementation doesn't line up with their descriptions, and an example of this is the infamous Vanish Doom exploit. In Final Fantasy VI, the Vanish status raised the target's physical evasion to 100%, but lowered their magic evasion to zero, rendering them vulnerable to magic attacks. As a support ability, the intention was for players to use this to bolster their defences against physical foes. When cast on enemies, Vanish would have the same effect as on players, but would also override their natural immunities with other status magic such as Doom, making such magic attacks hit them 100% of the time. This meant that any enemy you could cast Vanish on could also be defeated instantly through the use of Doom regardless of prior resistances, and this even applied to bosses. Unintentional exploits such as these are usually found as a result of players using the game's systems in unintended ways, and therefore aren't always caught in the debugging process. It goes without saying that exploits similar to this are therefore found in many other games in the franchise, and Final Fantasy Tactics is no exception with one glitch in particular being very helpful. Known as the JP Scroll Glitch, this exploit allowed players to gain 9,999 job points instantly for most jobs that had a scrollable ability list. To execute the glitch, the player had to simply select an ability that they had enough job points to learn, and then when the game asked them to confirm learning that ability, they needed to press and hold the square button while pressing down the d-pad to scroll to a different ability with a higher JP cost. Confirming after this could result in a variety of effects, but the best outcome would change the player's available JP to zero, and upon exiting and re-entering the abilities page would award the player with 9,999 job points for that job. Using this exploit, it's easy to learn high level abilities very quickly, so it's no surprise that the technique has become a staple of Final Fantasy Tactics speedrunners. All of the job points and abilities in the world won't change the fact that Final Fantasy Tactics is one of the most difficult games in the franchise, with several dastardly points of no return, soft locks, and very tough boss encounters. And some of these harder encounters are thanks in part to the main antagonist of the story, the Lucavi. Seeking to resurrect their long-dead master, Ultima, under the guise of the Church of Glabados, there are six known Lucavian tactics, each being connected to a corresponding Shard of Orosite. Known as a Zodiac Stone, these Orosite Shards allowed them to exist in the world of Ivalice through the use of a human host. Seeing as the Zodiac Stones refer to the 12 Zodiac Signs, it was interesting that there are not 12 Lucavi encountered by the player in the game, but just because we did not meet them, does not mean they did not exist. By deciphering the text in the background image of the save screen, it was possible to learn that the Lucavi met by Ramza in tactics have respective zodiac signs, as for example Belias represented Ares and Ultima represented Virgo. In addition to this, we also got to see the six additional Lucavi linked to the remaining zodiac signs, including Duma to Taurus, Brefocale to Sagittarius, and Leviathan to Pisces. One of these unused Lucavi, however, was originally intended to appear in-game, before being cut for unknown reasons. 
This was the demon Rofakale, and its inclusion would have brought the total number of Lucavi encountered to seven. Unfortunately, not much is known about how Rofakale would have appeared in the game, only that it was indeed cut. In future Ivalice titles, the Lucavi would reappear as espers to the player and be obtained as summonable entities, but Rofakale was not repurposed in this manner alongside its Final Fantasy tactics siblings. Instead, it was replaced by Shem Hazai as the representative for Sagittarius in Final Fantasy XII and its associated properties. It wouldn't be until the return to Ivalice Raid series in Final Fantasy XIV's Stormblood expansion that players would finally get to meet Rofakale in all its glory. Appearing as the third boss in the Royal City of Rabinastra's Alliance dungeon, it would use abilities from Final Fantasy tactics such as Crush Helm and Armor Crush on players and take on the form of an armored chariot centaur-like beast. And as a further aside here, it was also interesting that Duma, the Taurus Lucavi from Final Fantasy tactics, was brought back as well to be part of this raid series. Even though Rofakale didn't appear in Ivalice until Final Fantasy XIV, there was another hidden Lucavi, one not mentioned alongside the other 12, that appeared in not only Tactics but also 14, and would end up having a much larger role than its sidelined comrade. As stated, there was one Lucavi for each of the 12 zodiac signs. That being said, most of the Final Fantasy games that take place in Ivalice make use of a secret additional zodiac sign, Yophiuchus. Also known as Serpentarius, it was propagated in popular culture through the publication of a book called The 13 Signs of the Zodiac, a book which just happened to be a bestseller in Japan throughout the mid-90s, and this could possibly explain its inclusion in numerous Final Fantasy games around that time. In Tactics, the possessor of the Ophiuchus Zodiac Stone was the Mage Elidibus, a name that Final Fantasy XIV players will immediately recognise, and when encountered in the optional and very difficult Deep Dungeon, or Midlight Steep as it was later called, Elidibus would use the stone to transform into a Lucavi of the same name. In battle, Elidibus would use a wide variety of powerful magic against the player, but most notable of all was his use of the powerful Zodiac Summon, a spell which could then be learnt by the player if they were lucky enough to survive it and happen to have a summoner in their party. In Final Fantasy XII, Zodiac would go on to appear as the Esper that corresponded with Ophiuchus, replacing Elidibus. This suggested that Elidibus may just be the name of the Hue Mage in tactics prior to the Lucavi transformation and not the Lucavi itself, but this is just speculation. As an additional fun fact, it should be noted that the location the player encounters Elidibus in, Deep Dungeon, is not only a reference to a series of role-playing games by developer Hummingbird Soft that Square published as part of the Disc Original Group, but also contains references to both the Japanese and English translations of the film Apocalypse Now, with the names of the levels featuring titles such as No Geis or Psycon Backwards, Valkyries, and Malapan or Napalm Backwards. Now, up to this point, we've covered unique status effects, hidden zodiac signs, and unused Lucavi. But despite tactics featuring an impressive array of selectable jobs for the player to experiment with, there were even more that remained unused. As tactics made use of diorama-like sets to not only stage its combat encounters but also tell its story, a lot of the same locales were used for cinematic sequences as well as combat encounters. Due to this, there were NPC sprites for certain important characters that appeared on maps in non-combative roles. As all players who showed up in the game were treated as having jobs by the game's engine, many character-specific jobs appeared for plot-relevant NPCs even if they did not fight in the battles themselves, with examples being Cardinal, Duke, and Witch of the Coven. What's interesting is that many of these were fleshed out with specific stats and even job descriptions, but the developers stopped short of adding abilities, and as a result, if these jobs were applied to playable characters through hacking or cheat devices, it can sometimes cause the game to glitch. Now, as the player would have no way of knowing this through normal play, it's very interesting that Square took the time to create these roles and flesh them out, even if they never had the intention of using them within combat scenarios. And that brings us on to our last, rather juicy fact, that the Japanese version of Tactics had a secret sound test mode that was cut from the original English release, and it not only allowed players to listen to the entire soundtrack in-game, but also provided invaluable insight into the minds of the composers. Originating in the arcades as a way of testing a unit's audio capabilities, sound test modes began to be included in home console releases in the late 80s and early 90s, and were popular options for games such as Sonic, Streets of Rage or Kirby, but they were not regularly seen within the Final Fantasy franchise. And in Tactics, the way of accessing it was not quite as straightforward. The player would have to input Ramza's name at the beginning of the game as BGM Kikitai, which apparently roughly translates to I want to listen to background music, this would then open a menu where the songs would be selectable. 
Within, as both Hitoshi Sakamoto and Masaharu Iwata worked on the soundtrack, players will be able to see which composer worked on which track via their development nicknames. But beyond that, the fascinating aspect was that the sound test mode allowed the player to look into what the composers were thinking as various tracks included commentary similar to linear notes in a physical music release. Highlights from these notes include Hitoshi Sakamoto's thoughts on the popular hero's theme. He said, Ramza's theme in a reminiscing key. FYI, this was another song where I discovered a small bug in the driver. Poor Suzuki turned pale when he found out. That made me a little happy. If you'd like to see more of these notes, then please head over to the awesome Smuplations. I'll put a link in the description. As mentioned in our previous video on tactics, non-Japanese copies of the game were missing some additional content in the form of sound novels. But this unfortunately meant that players of the non-Japanese version were also missing some music tracks as well, as contained in the sound test option were variants of the background music that were cut from these sound levels. This makes the Japanese soundtrack the de facto definitive and larger tactics soundtrack and is an essential listen for any fan of the game. It wouldn't be until the release of War of the Lions that players outside of Japan would have access to the sound test mode and its method of unlocking was very similar. If you'd like to give it a try yourself, all you have to do is name Ramza Polka Polka and you'll be taken straight there, complete with the missing sound novel background tracks. And that just about wraps it up. There were seven more facts about Final Fantasy Tactics that you probably didn't know, but I'm sure there were still some amongst you who knew them all. Let us know in the comments below which you found to be the most interesting, and if you enjoyed the video, please do hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. With that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd love to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin, the livestream, and Gregory, who are super special Onionite supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching the video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.